Uh, and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. We are in day four of the hurricane-induced crisis in coastal Texas. We're continuing to watch developments tonight in Houston, where rain continues to fall in just epic amounts, and where local authorities are having to make hard decisions about essentially what neighborhoods and what areas they may have to condemn to further flooding on purpose uh, for the sake of the greater good. Today and tonight, Houston has been letting huge amounts of water flow out of flood control reservoirs into areas that have already been fatally inundated. They've been doing that to relieve the threat that those reservoirs and the dams that hold them together uh, might fail because of the massive volume of water. With the entire Texas National Guard now activated with hundreds of thousands of Americans in harm's way tonight, it is hard to overstate the magnitude of the crisis in Texas. Houston is uh, the country's fourth largest city. It's also the fastest growing major city in America. And even though Houston has been hit by disastrous flooding in the past, uh, including flooding caused by hurricanes, the, the rapid growth and sprawl in the Houston area has created worse conditions for a storm like this. It's also created some seemingly insurmountable challenges in terms of trying to move people out of harm's way and trying to rescue people uh, when the effort to get them out of harm, harm's way uh, is a failed effort. So we're continuing to watch this story tonight. Uh, we're going to be getting a live report from Houston in just a moment. Um, we're also going to be speaking with an expert tonight uh, who's an expert specifically on, on, on the question of what options Houston has right now, what options Texas has right now in the middle of this thing to cope with what has happened over the last four days and what is likely to continue to get worse over the next 48 hours. They have some very painful decisions to make and getting a sense of um, what options they have and uh, what those what the consequences of their decisions might be at this point. Um, it's, it's very difficult stuff, but we're going to be covering that in detail tonight. Today has also seen a cascade of breaking news, some fairly stunning breaking news about the Trump organization and the Trump campaign and its ties to Russia at the time that Russia was attacking the U.S. presidential election last year. Uh, Carol Lennig is one of the investigative reporters of The Washington Post who broke this story open both over the weekend and then today. Carol Lennig is going to join us live here in just a moment. Um, we've also got a little bit of news to break tonight on the Trump-Russia Russia dossier. Uh, the dossier that was prepared by former British MI6 agent Christopher Steele last year, that dossier of alleged Russian dirt on Donald Trump that was published by BuzzFeed in January, created such an uproar at the time. People who commissioned that dossier have described it as a roadmap for the investigation into whether or not Trump colluded with the Russian attack. People who commissioned that dossier also stand by it and say that the dossier is correct. That dossier is now back at the center of what we know about the Trump-Russia investigation. We're, we're going to be breaking a little bit of news on that later in the show this evening. But you know, the day that we, the public, all first learned about the dossier was actually before the election. It was on October 31st, Halloween 2016. David Korn at Mother Jones Magazine was the first person in the country to break the news that a former Western intelligence agent had collected a series of intelligence reports that were potentially very damaging um, to Donald Trump, specifically in terms of his relationship with Russia. Uh, David Korn reported on, on Halloween, just before the election, that the FBI had seen these findings and was looking into them. Again, that report, October 31st, 2016. Nobody quite knew what to make of it at the time. Uh, I, w I, wish that I, I, I wish that I had known what to make of it at the time. I wish we all had, right? It really wasn't until the dossier itself was published months later in January, after the election, that we all learned how serious this thing was that David Korn had been describing in October. But on that same day that David Korn published that prescient story, right, the, the story that in retrospect now appears to be so important, but at the time we didn't really get it. On that same day, there was another really big, hard to understand story that kind of landed the same way. Uh, it was written by Franklin Four at Slate.com. He wrote a long piece that was published on Halloween that described unusual computer interactions between a computer server in Trump Tower, serving the Trump Organization, and a computer server in Moscow associated with a big Russian bank called Alpha Bank. And what this Slate article described was 
kind of hard to put your finger on in terms of its significance, but the granular reporting was that there was an unusually high volume of server-to-server -server communications of some kind between those two servers in Moscow and Trump Tower, and there was no reporting on what the content of those communications were. I mean, there were ultimately multiple competing explanations offered as to why those servers might have been communicating with each other, but it was honestly really never explained in terms of what the significance of that information was. And because of that, because it didn't have a clear bottom line, it was just like a, hmm, I think ultimately that story kind of withered away in the public consciousness. Whatever the reason was, why the Trump Organization computer servers and Alpha Bank's computer servers were talking to each other during the campaign, that just... It's interesting, but we didn't know what it meant, and there didn't seem to be any other notable connection between Donald Trump and Alphabet. So, interesting story. We don't really know what it means, and the whole thing kind of went to the back of the stack in terms of things to worry about when it comes to Donald Trump and Russia. You know, maybe that whole Alphabet server thing was just a coincidence or just some technical glitch. That story came out October 31st on Slate.com. Then, a week later, Donald Trump won the election. Um, and then during the transition, where he was, when, when he was president-elect, there emerged the next weird, inexplicable, maybe coincidental thing involving Trump world and a Russian bank. One of the numerous contacts with Russian officials that Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, did not disclose on his request for a security clearance uh, was a meeting that he took at Trump Tower during the transition um, where he hosted the head of another Russian bank. Jared Kushner met with the head of a Russian bank that's called VEB Bank. VEB Bank is a bank, but it's really just an entity of the Russian government. The leadership of VEB Bank is handpicked by Vladimir Putin, uh, and VEB Bank's connections with Russian intelligence in particular are not subtle. Uh, Sergei Gorkov is the guy who Jared Kushner met with at Trump Tower during the transition. He's a graduate of the FSB Academy, which basically means he went to KGB grad school. Um, VEB Bank was also the cover organization for a big Russian spy ring that was busted up by the FBI a few years ago. That was the Russian spying operation where Trump foreign policy advisor Carter Page was found by the FBI to have been essentially a willing target for those Russian spies. At least he was a source of information for those Russian spies who were looking for Americans to give them information to help them with their spying efforts against America from their home base in New York where they were ostensibly working for VEB Bank, but really they were spies. So there was the Alpha Bank servers communicating with the Trump Organization for some reason. What's that Russian bank got to do with anything? Then in the transition, there's Jared Kushner meeting with the head of VEB Bank for some reason. What's that Russian bank got to do with it? Then, not long after Trump got inaugurated, along comes another inexplicable, seemingly random intersection between Trump world and yet another Russian bank. Uh, the next one we learned about was, I think, the biggest Russian bank of all, uh, a bank called Sberbank, uh, which announced in March that they had hired new counsel to represent them in a big, complicated civil case that was filed in federal court in New York, uh, in which the uh, Sberbank was accused, basically, of rigging the granite mining industry in Russia. Why is that a federal civil case in New York? It's a long story. But in March, Sberbank, in the middle of this case, they kind of surprised everybody. They made a lot of eyebrows arch in the legal news when they announced that they had chosen their new counsel for that long, complicated, and presumably very expensive case. And they said their new counsel was going to be Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Mark Kazowitz. Right? Mark Kazowitz, supposed to be heading up President Trump's legal representation on the Russia investigation? I mean, if you're the lead lawyer coordinating legal defense for the President of the United States who is facing a major counterintelligence and criminal investigation from the FBI while he is serving as President, if you're in charge of that, you think you'd be too busy to take on other clients, right? But, you know, looking at it from another angle, if there were Russian interests who were particularly concerned to know what was going on in the Trump-Russia investigation, it might also to be handy to have conversations under cover of attorney-client privilege with the lead lawyer for the president on the Trump-Russia investigations. So, who knows? Maybe that was just a coincidence, too. 
what's that big Russian bank doing with the president's Russia lawyer? So I mean, maybe the Alpha Bank thing was just a coincidence. Maybe the VEB Jared Kushner meeting was just a coincidence. Maybe the Spur Bank thing hiring Donald Trump's Russia lawyer. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. Maybe none of this has anything to do with President Donald Trump and whether or not he has some sort of illicit relationship financial or otherwise, with Russia that explains why Russia attacked our election and tried to rig it on his behalf, right? Maybe none of those bank connections, Alpha Bank, VEB Bank, Spur Bank, maybe none of those have anything to do with the question of whether Trump and his campaign knew about or were involved with the Russian effort to disrupt our election. I mean, if you, if you want to talk about Donald Trump personally and specifically, honestly, until today, the only big and sort of suspicious banking relationship we've known about him, at least recently, uh, isn't with any Russian bank. It's with Deutsche Bank, right? Which, as the name implies, is not Russian. Deutsche Bank still to this day is the bank uh, that Donald Trump owes hundreds of millions of dollars to. Deutsche Bank is the bank that dealt with Donald Trump in business terms for years when no other major banks would. Deutsche Bank is the bank that continued to lend President Trump hundreds of millions of dollars for various deals, even after he was unable to pay them back on some of his earlier loans, even after he went so far as to file lawsuits against Deutsche Bank because he failed to pay them back, <laughs> which is a certain kind of hubris. There are aspects of the Donald Trump Deutsche Bank relationship that have always seemed unexplained by the bounds of normal financial business dealings. Deutsche Bank, at least on the surface, appears to have been uncommonly generous to, generous to him and forgiving of him. Deutsche Bank also, it turns out, gave Jared Kushner several hundred million dollars in loans in October of last year, right before the election. Loans that Jared Kushner personally guaranteed, which made it all the more unusual that he failed to disclose those loans from Deutsche Bank on his financial disclosure statement. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Deutsche Bank has also been plagued over the last year by its legal liability for a multi-billion dollar Russian money laundering scheme that was operated out of Deutsche Bank offices in Moscow and London and elsewhere. But you know, after today, the Deutsche Bank Russian money laundering case will no longer be seen as the most concerning Deutsche Bank connection for President Trump when it comes to the Trump-Russia investigation. Because all right, there was Alpha Bank with the server thing, there was VEB Bank, with the Carter Page connection and then the Jared Kushner meeting. There's Spurbank hiring Trump's Russia lawyer. Right? There's, there's all these Russian banks that are getting these strange new starring roles in American politics. There's another one, it turns out. Alpha Bank, VEB Bank, Spurbank. There's another one called VTB Bank. It is a very large Russian bank. It's not as big as Spurbank, but it's really big. Uh, VTB Bank is sanctioned by the US government. Uh, because of Russia invading Crimea. This bank got sanctioned by the US government as punishment for Crimea because this bank is seen as the Russian government. It's an, an arm of the Russian government and that's how the US government views them. In fact, if you go to VTB's website tonight, you, you go click on about VTB and they will tell you in exact mathematical terms how they are controlled by the Russian government. The Russian government owns and controls 60.9% of VTB Bank. The majority shareholder of the VTB Bank is the Russian government, which owns 60.9% of the voting shares. What that means in plain English is that Putin runs VTB. Putin controls the bank and what it does and what it spends on. And today, we learned that up until last year, up until the middle of the presidential campaign, VTB Bank was lined up and committed to provide hundreds of millions of dollars in financing to build Trump Tower Moscow. The Russian government was gonna do that deal. It, it, actually, even without the knowledge that the financing for this deal was gonna come from the Russian government, it's still a heck of a bombshell. Right? This is not some old deal that happened back in the past that people might have forgotten about. This is not something Trump worked on in the 90s and it fell apart. This was what he was working on during the campaign, after he announced that he was running for president. Months into his presidential campaign, when he was full on running for president, he was trying to do this deal with the Russian government in Moscow. Uh, quoting from Carol Lennig's story on this in the Washington Post, quote, as the talks to build Trump Tower Moscow progressed, Trump voiced numerous supportive comments about Vladimir Putin on the campaign trail, setting himself apart from his Republican rivals for the nomination. 
Remember when Trump warned a few weeks ago in that interview with the New York Times that if Robert Mueller wanted to go looking into any of his business dealings, that would be crossing a red line because clearly none of those personal financial interests or business dealings had anything to do with Russia. That'd be crossing a red line. Well, now we know that his business, the Trump Organization, had everything to do with Russia, even during the campaign. And, you know, we, we probably should have seen this coming. Back in, back in May, we should have seen this coming when Donald Trump's lawyers started hiring their own lawyers. Uh, Michael Cohen, forever and a day, has been Donald Trump's lawyer. Uh, he's been his personal lawyer at times. He's been a Trump Organization executive and lawyer. When Trump started flirting with and then actually running for president in this past election cycle, Michael Cohen was his top and for most of the time his only political advisor. Michael Cohen is very, very, very close to Trump and Trump's business. He is Trump's lawyer and he did hire his own lawyer <coughs> this spring. He then confirmed that the committees investigating the Trump-Russia affair had asked him to give testimony and to hand over documents to those committees. Michael Cohen's response to those requests was, no, I won't. The committees then subpoenaed him to testify and also to hand over documents. He is due, as far as we know, to testify next week on Tuesday to the House Intelligence Committee. But apparently today he handed over documents to the House Intelligence Committee and some of those documents and a long statement about them found their way to certain reporters and publications on the handover of these documents to Congress. And just to read between the lines here a little bit, this does not, it, it does not appear that what happened here is that Michael Cohen handed stuff over to Congress and Congress leaked it. I'm not speaking from direct knowledge here. I am speaking in terms of reading between the lines. The way that this is phrased and described in the reporting tonight is that Michael Cohen handed this stuff over to the House Intelligence Committee and in so doing, gave some of it to reporters and a statement about it to reporters to put the best possible spin on that information himself before investigators themselves can start chewing on it and putting it out in their own terms. I mean, and in this case, the best possible spin is still pretty bad, right? The bottom line of what we've learned now from the Washington Post and the Times is that while Trump was insisting publicly that he had no deals with Russia and why he was questioned repeatedly about why he was being so bent over backwards positive about Vladimir Putin and Russia throughout the campaign, he never thought to mention, and apparently nobody in the Trump organization or the Trump campaign ever thought to mention, that during the presidential campaign for five months, of the presidential campaign. The Trump Organization was aggressively pursuing the building of a gigantic real estate project in Moscow that the Russian government had agreed to finance. Those negotiations included, in October, Trump signing a letter of intent to proceed with the project, October 2015. Michael Cohen says he spoke to Trump at least three times directly about the project. Michael Cohen, we now know, also wrote directly to the Kremlin last January. He wrote to Vladimir Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, to ask for direct Kremlin help in restarting discussions about the building project, which, which by then he said was stalled. The other Trump Organization figure involved in these negotiations is someone we have, we've talked about before named Felix Sater. He's a Russian-born ex-con uh, who was convicted of a $40 million mafia-connected pump-and-dump stock scheme. In 2013, Trump, in a, in a, in a uh, sworn deposition, uh, professed to not be able to recognize Felix Sater if he had been sitting in that room that day. It's a little hard to believe. Felix Sater had been associated with the Trump Organization for years. He carried a Trump business card that described himself as senior advisor to Donald Trump. Even after Trump said he wouldn't recognize him if he were in the room, <laughs> he said that in 2013. By 2015, apparently, Felix Sater was recognizable again because he was working with Michael Cohen to try to make this Trump Tower Moscow thing happen. And, and, and Trump was signing off on the letter of intent to move forward with it. Michael Cohen, I think, has to testify to House Intel next week. He definitely seems to have handed over documents to House Intel today. His strategy in so doing is to try to spin what he's handed over in the best possible way. It still looks very bad. It also appears to be to try to play down the importance of Felix Sater and his involvement in this project, especially Sater's comments in the emails that have been handed over to Congress now and to some reporters um, in which Felix Sater brags that there's something about this real estate deal in Moscow that in the end will result in Donald Trump becoming president of the United States. Quote, our boy can become president of the USA and we can engineer it. 
I will get all of Putin's team to buy in on this. I will manage this process. Felix Sater wrote this to Michael Cohen, quote, Michael, I arranged for Ivanka to sit in Putin's private chair at his desk and office in the Kremlin. I know how to play it, and we will get this done. Michael Cohen's strategy in releasing these documents to the press, ahead of him giving them to Congress, involves him playing down whether or not Felix Sater really could have been serious about that. He told the, he put out a statement that said, quote, over the course of my business dealings with Mr. Sater, he has sometimes used colorful language and has been prone to salesmanship. That said, this is my favorite part of the whole thing. When the Times today went to check out Felix Sater's boast that he was so connected, he could deliver the Putin side of this deal. He was so connected, he was able to arrange for Ivanka Trump to sit in Putin's private chair at his desk in his office in the Kremlin. When the New York Times checked out that boast today, the response from Team Ivanka was not exactly on brand. <laughs> Ivanka Trump told the Times she did, in fact, take a brief tour of Red Square and the Kremlin when she was in Moscow with Felix Sater, but she insists she was only there, quote, as a tourist. I have to say, though, it does not seem she had a totally typical tourist experience because, quote, she said it is possible she sat in Mr. Putin's chair. <laughs> but maybe that's just a coincidence. Or don't all tourist visitors to the Kremlin get to sit in Putin's chair? Alpha Bank, then VEB Bank, then Spurbank, now VTB Bank, which is the Russian government, agreeing to finance to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a Trump Tower Moscow project that no one ever admitted to before today. That was happening during the campaign. Probably all just a coincidence. There's a lot going on today. Lots happening in the news. Uh, Carol Lenning joins us next. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.